All right. All right. Um, first of all, uh, this is so awesome. I, I'm such a huge fan of, of both of you. So, uh, you know, very excited to talk about Brooklyn 45, which um, I have to say has been living rent free in my head for a while. Um, so that's really fantastic. Um, I guess my first question would be, um, how did you all get um, involved in this project? Um, okay, I'll, my story I think is like less interesting, so I'll go first. <laughs> no, I uh, <clears throat> I just, I auditioned. Um, I, I read the script four years, maybe longer than four years ago when Ted was first, had first uh, started kind of trying to get it out there and I loved it so much. And I was like, wait, Ted, like you wrote this for me, all right, right? <laughs> Like, this is like, you know, you know, we're friends, you know, I'm like, of course you thought of me when you wrote this. He's like, well, uh, I, I'm not even sure if he answered the question because he's so diplomatic always, but, um, <clears throat> uh, and, uh, and anyway, they weren't, I was not on their list of people to play the role. And I told him like, I am going to convince whoever is not convinced that I'm supposed to play this role. And, uh, and then, you know, many after the pandemic because obviously that put such a ringer in everything um he contacted me and was like we're getting this movie made and um you know I know I you can do this but can you audition for it just to make us you know make everybody see what I know or whatever and uh and so I did and and then I got the part nice. see never, never have to stop auditioning always have to <laughs> keep on <laughs> That is actually a much better story than mine. I just simply, uh, I had been in Ted's previous movie, We Are Still Here, and there was a seance scene. And I think Ted has told this story often, but a lot of people said that scene was so great. It was me and Andrew Sensenegg. Uh, and they said, and then they said, you should make a whole movie that's a seance movie. So uh, Ted took them up on it, them meaning whoever these various uh, people were. Uh, and he wrote Brooklyn 45 for a number of reasons, but I think he had in mind that I might uh, be uh, Hawk, the character that I play. And um, so he invited me to do it. And, you know, I couldn't refuse because it's a great role. And I was honored that he thought of me because a lot of people wouldn't think of me for that part. I didn't necessarily. Uh, but, you know, I, I have. Uh, I had access to that character so i enjoyed the challenge and it was a big deal as you know we uh we shot in that single location with uh all the actors present and it really was like performing a play and we did long long takes maybe from different angles but it still was uh it wasn't chopped up it was very nice hmm. the way ted designed the shoot uh so you really got to get into scenes yeah, that's amazing. And that, that kind of um, goes to my one of my other questions, which was, um, you know, the challenges of a single sh uh, lo location uh, shoot must be, uh, again, like you said, almost akin to a play where you have to have everything memorized, not only that, but like your mark and, and um, I mean, hats off, because I, I, I can't imagine how difficult that would be. Well, a lot of movies are very fractured and you go to a location and surely that is uh, inspiring. You know, you're in a store or you're in a parking lot or you're doing this and that uh, and location movies can have that quality. It was a big deal when we broke out and did the, the opening scene that was in uh, uh, a neighborhood in Chicago and it felt, <laughs> oh wow, this is like a real movie where you show up on set and you're <laughs> having a lunch out of uh, uh, lunch boxes and all of that but uh, the majority we were just in this huge freezing cold warehouse we all had blankets offset and, <laughs> and heaters uh, yeah it was, and it was just a very warm environment this this was a huge warehouse that had been abandoned um and it was filled with uh all kinds of props because it was like what was the deal do you remember oh, yeah it was like a sears like an old sears or i'm not sure if it was sears or one of those old companies that was yeah. like i want to say um yeah where like they would i was all i don't know they had shoots there i mean there were whole sets there was like the little uh the the, the 
cute little neighborhood uh, house and all of this. It was very surreal. And, one and weren't they getting rid of, like, weren't they closing it down after we shot there or something? So well, they're trying to get rid of a lot of stuff. They let uh, this little production company uh, come and piggyback on there. So everything about it was peculiar and unique and mm -hmm. very kind of uh, cozy. Yeah. Um, now, this question is for, for um, both of you. Um, uh, would you say, uh, you know, the costumes uh, help you really get in, you get into character, really inform your character that and some of the, you know, old timey vernacular, d does all that really help, you know, kind of bring that character to life? Oh, Button wants to answer this question. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, for me, I am a totally, I, I like to work like that. I know a lot of actors don't, or there, it's like sometimes it's even frowned upon to say that you like to work from the outside in, like from the costume inwards, but I love working like that. And maybe it's because I come from the stage and, you know, mm -hmm. they're like, your costumes are a little bit maybe bigger than, you know, that creates a lot of the character. So that's kind of my, I'm not saying I don't also meet it halfway from my inside life, but um, I love when I get to know or like see a photo or an image of like when Ted sent me what he imagined Hildy to look like or what she was wearing, it, it really helped me. Um, and I, yeah, I think the costume totally gets me more into the character, into the world. Um, when I did my audition, I actually did something I've never done before. And I, to this day, I'm like, I should do this more often. I had a photo of a soldier that I was talking to an American soldier. So I was like, because it was mostly a monologue, I didn't really, I didn't have anybody else talking back at me, which is very rare in an audition. So I just put this image of this soldier in front of me as if I was back in the 1940s talking to this, this guy. So it actually, yeah, it does, it does help, I think, you know. No, oh, I agree. And, you know, for the male characters, we, uh, the, the standard of the time was to have your pants very high up around your waist and just things like that. And, and the shoes you wear as an actor are really important and they ground you uh, and it affects your posture and then whatever props you're given. So, I mean, even the so-called method actors would have to admit that when you put the jacket on or whatever, uh, that affects your experience. And, you know, it's funny when I first saw the movie, I was like, well, voice was I using and I wasn't even aware <laughs> that I had sort of taken on this persona and that's a wonderful moment to realize well whether it works or not is another matter but just that uh, I was deep in <laughs> you know I was this other dude so those things yeah I agree it's um, acting from the outside in is fair game because that's you're creating an image you have to every actor is aware of that yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, your voice has to match your outfit, practically. I mean, it's like, you know, you can't just like be all casual when you're wearing like uh, like a uniform. You know, it's the same thing even with like, you know, police roles or something. I'm actually playing a police officer right now, which I've never done. And I'm like, oh, my God, like I put on that police uniform and I'm like, I'm a different person. You know, I just I I talk differently. I kind of like my New York comes out a little bit more. Which is weird. I'm like, I don't know, you know, um, but yeah. No, that I, yeah, I mean, I could imagine, you know, putting on that uniform, it's like, okay, you're, you're in charge now, you're, <laughs> you know? um, but no, uh, and, and, you know, we got accents, of course, you know, Hildy and the German accent, was that difficult? Um, did you work um, hard on, on getting that? Because um, it, it's really fantastic uh, in the movie. No, oh, thank you. I mean, I do. I love accents and languages. I mean, I, I grew up speaking German and my parents have German accents. So, you know, it's like it's I've I've definitely been around it. But, you know, strangely, sometimes when you're around an accent, you don't always you can't always mimic it so well because it's too close to you. So when I first started doing the German accent back, like, I don't even remember when I first did it, I actually had to learn it. I really started to write down the syllable, like how, you know, I would listen to them more, more specifically and be like, what are they, how do they say that? Or how does, you know, is it the Z, but then sometimes it's the, and then, you know, like it's, so they mix it up. It, an accent isn't so perfect, right? Every person has a different way of, um, and, and I've done a lot of video games. So I think in the video game world, you don't, 
you you want to make sure no matter what that you can understand what you, that people can understand you right and so you kind of find this happy medium between an authentic accent but you know perhaps and in Hildy's case she had been living in America for 10 years so she's not like you know right she didn't just come for the first time it isn't speaking English for the first time she's been speaking for 10 years so you find that happy medium of like how has she Americanized her accent as well you know yeah. And I, I, what's interesting, and um, we're going to get into slight spoilers, but I figure it's been out for a little while now on Shudder. Uh, you know, uh, I love Shudder. Um, so, uh, you know, with Hildy, did you have like a backstory for her? Like, like I know there's an ambiguity of, of her character. Was there always something in mind that you had that was she a Nazi? Was she not a Nazi? Was there something that like you you like I said you kind of reverse engineered having a conclusion with her uh and then worked back yeah I mean it was not too complicated in my mind because in my mind she was not a Nazi like I mean I I I think like in my mind she really wants to fit in in America like she really wanted to you know be just just be an American you know and um you know, it's funny because I guess that was the way that I, there was never a question in my mind, but now when people come up to me and are like, yeah, but it's like, you know, she could have been, there were a lot of people at the time. There was like a whole, I, I didn't even know this. There was this pro-Nazi uh, Madison Square Garden, like, do you know about this? This was like in 1930 something. Um, the reason why I know about it is I did a, an audio book called Good Night from Paris, which is, takes place in, and there's this um, journalists, they're all based on real characters who talks about how disappointed she was that in New York, in America, they had this pro-Nazi rally in 1939 or 1938 or something. I don't know, around then in New York, it, near like outside of Madison Square Garden. If you look at the photos now, the historical, you'll be like, what? This happened in New York? What? Like, and so there were a lot of people that were pro, you know, the Nazi party, maybe not knowing what was going on in the concentration camps or knowing like that part of, you know, because the, the kind of information ability to get information was maybe not as it is today. Right. So I don't know, or maybe they, I don't know what they knew. Um, so the idea that she could have been like, maybe, maybe she had been pro the Nazi party, but maybe she changed her mind or like all of those things are now coming out what, after I've watched the movie. Uh -huh. um, but, but I, I never thought of it when I played the character that she was at all affiliated with the party or a spy for sure. Um, and also I, I wore this t-shirt uh, for you, Larry, because you play a corpse for a while. Um, <laughs> That had to be, uh, I don't know if I want to say fun, but that had to be interesting um, to just, I mean, how how long were you actually, like when you weren't reanimated, uh, did they just have you kind of hanging out in certain scenes, just like laying in a pool of blood or? <laughs> yeah, I mean, without giving away uh, film tricks, I, I was there for a day where they were interacting with the corpse and we felt it would be more effective to, uh, to have, the actor there uh but i did not stay for the two extra weeks while everybody was <laughs> acting in the corner uh i'm not that dedicated and ted very kindly found a way to uh to work around it so i had i had a day of wonderful corpse work and then it was quite invigorating <laughs> to be able to wake up and then do the uh the scary wacky stuff that was uh invigorating after lying there for hours yeah, and again, it's just, I mean, everything sells it from your performance to the sound effects, like the, you know, like when you would move your neck a little bit, and it's like creaky, and it sounds like when I wake up in the morning, because I'm old <laughs> now, <laughs> but, um, oh gosh, it's, it's quite so exciting to see uh, when Ted first put the um, scene together, he would always show you little nuggets on the phone, mm. and showed me that scene and I was like oh wow this could work so it was great fun yeah no it's amazing now if uh if y'all had to um switch roles with any other actor uh like their characters uh what would it be like who would you what have uh, alternatively played Christina 
<laughs> um, gosh. I mean, I guess the, the most straightforward answer would be Marla, mm -hmm. you know, um, but I don't know, actually maybe Hawk, <laughs> maybe yeah. like Hawk, like having that monologue would be fucking like great <laughs> to do cool. that. Yeah. I think Archie has the richest, mm -hmm. I like his backstory, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, his torment. I mean, it's a great role and Jeremy does such a great job of it. Oh, uh, I'm actually getting chills right now thinking about it. It's it's so good. Y'all are so good, though. Like, I, I love how everybody kind of gets their moment. Um, and I need to wrap up, but just really quick, um, you know, what can fans expect from y'all coming up? Is there any projects that you can um, talk about? Yeah. I, I'm, I've got the uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre game coming out August 18th. For any of you gamers out there, I play Sissy, Sissy Slaughter, the new family member, and she is the best character. So you should play her. And um, I'm working on a movie right now that uh, where I'm playing that cop, which is kind of a bigger budget film, but I can't talk. I can't really say anything about it. So. Wow. Uh, I'm premiering my werewolf movie in Fantasia in a couple of weeks. So that's exciting. Oh, nice. Uh, that's great. Uh, well, I hope to check that out. And thank, thank you all so much for taking the time to talk to me. This has been such an honor. Like I said, big fan of, of both y'all. So um, everybody needs to check out Brooklyn 45. It is on Shutter right now. And again, thank you so much. I love your shelf, dude. I know, me too. I was thinking that too. I was yeah. going to say, I, I probably have a lot of y'all's movies up up there. So, <laughs> I love it. Thanks, man. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Bye.